Okay, we have another episode, and this episode is uh, about a situation very localized in Tennessee, um, but the situation plays out very frequently around the U.S. So, can our can the guests please introduce yourselves? Yeah, I can start. Uh, so. Uh, my name is Cecilia Prado. I use she, they pronouns. And up to March 6th of this year, I was the executive director at a worker center uh, in Nashville, the only worker center in Tennessee. And I'm um, T. I was the former communications and fundraising organizer at Workers Dignity. Um, I use any pronouns and yeah, I mean, I've been, I've been in Nashville like less than a year at this point. Okay. And what kind of work do y'all do before we get into, you know, what happens, you know? Yeah. yeah. I mean, the work that workers dignity, uh, does or was doing under my leadership and, uh, T just named it. I was a little cautious right there, but, um, yeah, so Workers' Dignity is the only worker center in Tennessee. And over the last four years, um, you know, we have uh, been building a base of low-wage workers that are supposed to be the force leading the organization. Um, during that time, they uh, built successful tenant unions that were able to secure historic victories from uh, multi-billion dollar landlords and developers. Um, they were able to build political power uh, to secure a $7 million investment in the affordable housing fund, going specifically to uh, housing cooperatives that were built over land trust. So basically uh, taking the land off the market and uh, making sure that people had long-term uh, housing, affordable housing, um, that they could actually have agency over their living conditions. And that's some of the work that we were able to do. Um, we have also um, been uh, training workers how to fight, how to build unions in their workplaces, how to fight against wage theft through uh, public pressure and organizing tactics uh, outside of uh, litigation, right? Because Tennessee uh, is the worst state in terms of labor laws in the country. Uh, we have one of the most powerful chambers of commerce, if not the most powerful chamber of commerce in the whole country. And, you know, they work in tandem with uh, other associations and with the Christian right to pass policy that only uh, benefits employers. And so we have a very hostile environment and a uh, wage theft is also not a crime in Tennessee. So we've been able to like teach workers how to recover wages um, through uh, different means. Um, we were working on a, uh, a student coalition of 15 student organizations at Vanderbilt, and we're organizing uh, the students alongside construction workers. Uh, so in summary, we organize around the two sides of development. We organize construction workers at you know, the workplace and at the industry level, and then also we organize tenants um, within an apartment complex, whether they wanna get something from their landlord or at the uh, city level, uh, asking for um, you know different affordable housing um, investments. So that's that's kind of like the gist of what we do. T, do you want to add anything or? Um. Yeah. I mean, so I was, I was um, hired in late January, and although like obviously my express duties are communications and fundraising, I, you know, saw that the organizing campaigns at Workers' Dignity have led to like some serious material wins and gains. And as somebody who worked on the right to work, um, the right to work, like Amendment 1 stuff in Tennessee, which ult ultimately failed um, and not being listened to about why those failures were important and what they point out about our labor movement, um, I had to seek employment elsewhere because I raised those concerns and I was furloughed for it. Um, I ended up at Workers' Dignity because they were the only job that would hire me to do the work I wanted to do. 
And a lot of that revolved around like building a resilient black labor movement that had cross racial solidarity, cross language solidarity, and really like aiding, aiding the base building efforts through my experience as like um, a Pan-African organizer to really get some wins. Like um, there were a number of campaigns that, you know, upon even like before I got hired, I started kind of getting looped in on like hops and flats, which was like mainly black and brown um, people in an affordable housing complex. Um, there were some black community focused campaigns that we were supposed to start to um, organize some more uh, more like demographically targeted industries and corporations that were based in Tennessee. So, you know, everything that Cecilia is talking about is stuff that she was able to do, you know, under her direction and leadership. And then everything that we were trying to work on together was ultimately um, hindered, I'll say, by this effort. I, I won't say that they've been completely um, abolished, but the, everything I wanted to do, I didn't even get a chance to do is kind of my point. Okay. so. My next question is, you know, um, what happened? And I, I would say, just from my observation, um, I've been following y'all for a little bit uh, before the incident. Um, I noticed that, I don't want to start the conversation here, but from what I, I noticed is that Cecilia posted something in support of like Marxism, right? And then what happened, it, it just, I mean, it went downhill fast. and. Uh, you know, so people that follow the Instagram, the Decolonized Buffalo Instagram, um, I've been, you know, posting and supporting y'all on this, you know, situation. And sometimes I was confused, like, why did that happen? And why did this, you know, so I think, but hearing it from y'all before the recording, and then, <laughs> so please uh, let the listeners know what happened. I think there's two sides. So Cecilia, you should probably start with like, what happened on your end? Yeah, I mean, I I think there is so many many things. So uh, when we are thinking about like what happened at Workers Dignity, I think you know there was a crash that was inevitable and that we were you know able to uh, delay for four years while I was a uh, you know the director of the organization. Um, however. Uh, you know, in summary, like what happened in March is that I got fired by the board. And just to put it into more context, the board of directors is composed of uh, workers or members uh, that are elected democratically. It's supposed to have low wage workers that, you know, that are members that are active in our campaigns and programs. And each campaign and program should have, you know, like two representatives. Um, however, the board currently is uh, two cis men representing the construction campaign and one um, uh, cis woman that is uh, representing one of the housing campaigns. Um, so it's a very small uh, board of directors um, and they are the only entity in the organization. Even though I have a title of executive director, I do not have executive powers. I don't have the power to hire, fire. Uh, promote or discipline employees. And so uh, that is a uh, big power that the board of directors has over us. And so they bear, they, they fired me for several reasons that I can expand, um, including the fact that I led a strike in September of 2022. But it's also just a result of, of a long, um, you know, power struggle in between between staff and the board uh, that has been around since, you know, I can remember at the organization, you know, in the organization, uh, one of the things that I knew before I even started to work um, at Workers' Dignity was that like Workers' Dignity ha went through different crises every year since its founding. Uh, so there's something structural to it that, that I can talk about, but also, anyways, I got fired. Then my staff went on strike. 
um, you know, it, it's a very difficult structure at Workers Dignity because you have the board that has all this power and at the same time they are workers um, and they are also, um, you know, their decisions are often influenced by different forces, right? Like, for example, Workers Dignity has very influential founders um, and, a, and a very influential founding cadre, which happened to not agree with my politics and uh, not agree with my actions. Um, and so that also was influencing the decision. Yeah, no, I mean, um, and to add on that, like, when I was first kind of getting into the labor spaces in Nashville, like, I understood very quickly that it was like, very explicitly anti Marxist. Um, you know, I used to work at one of the more prominent labor organizations, which I won't name. Um, but they they would never use the word like class struggle, like, um, they only talked about corporations and like they they really refused to work use the word working class. They might say working families or maybe sometimes workers, but you could tell that there was like an aspect of like, you know, respect, respect and like capitulation and the same these are these are the same people who are responsible for the state of labor. Like they can blame Republicans all they want. But a lot of these people involved in this story who claim to have experience, like their experience is failing, um, quite frankly. And as a as the youngest person involved in all of this, like I'm 22 years old, um, there's just like a lot of um, really like petty behavior. And so I came to find out about Cecilia because, you know, I had seen some of the people who worked at Workers' Dignity and when they had like talked at this one meeting I was at, I was interested and I asked my mentor about it. And I was just told basically like, oh, they do good work, but like stay away. Uh, it's messy, they're anti-black. Um, and you know, this organization that I was a part of, they said the same thing, stay away, it's messy, they're anti-black. But I would still see people coming to all of like inviting workers dignity to stuff like when it when it came to like actually doing labor stuff for some reason workers dignity was always still there um and so like i used i i just had time to like really investigate for myself i'm like well you know if they're if they're this awful then why don't you take responsibility for the work that they're doing you know um and nobody was and nobody was working directly with workers they might be working with unions they might be working with um labor advocates, but they were never working with workers. And so Cecilia and I had kind of like met a little bit before, but I did ask about like this position because I was like, hey, you know, I make a lot of like agitational art and I use a lot of it to effectively communicate and I have experience with fundraising. Um, but we also really related over kind of being like targeted for reasons that didn't have to do with the explicit stated reasons of um of our politic you know not capitulating not being able not being willing to sell your people out for the smallest concessions and um so when i got hired i was hired by the whole staff and the board's approval um and i was supposed to be onboarded by paige mckay who was the operations and hr manager Paige never gave me full access to any of the accounts as the social media person, communications person. Like I didn't even get the full access to all the accounts. Like I never even got to log into the Facebook um, because Paige wouldn't do their job. And, you know, I also kind of became like a pseudo operations manager because of Paige, because there were so many things that I was trying to do to expand our capacity. And a lot of that fundraising had something to do with it. Oh. Yes, sorry. Yes, I have a question. And did you ever, you know, tell Paige, hey, I have no access? What was their response? Um, you don't mind me asking if you can say. Yeah. yeah. I mean, a lot of times I wouldn't get a response to stuff or it'd be like, hey, yeah, I'll deal with it later. And like later would never come. But a lot of times, like Paige would just push everything off to Cecilia. 
And it's like really funny because in the end, like Paige is the person who went to the board to tell them to fire Cecilia. Um, but a lot of the stuff like that they'll say is like Cecilia overreaching. It's really like Paige didn't want to do her job and would push it off on Cecilia. So the like last pass account with all the passwords, Paige never gave it to me, but you know, it was like, oh, well, uh, Cecilia has to approve that. Yeah. So sorry, you're not going to get it. And then Cecilia had to go get it for me. Um, and that had a lot of our accounts for grant writing. It had a lot of our accounts for uh, fundraising purposes. And so it got to the point where I was doing Paige's job so much without the full access, because I'm also supposed, I was probably one of those positions that was supposed to have a credit card or from what I know. And I never got that. So, and I never had our financial accounts. So when I started doing Paige's job for her, I ended up coming out of pocket $600 towards the end of the month when rent was due in February or early March, um, late February. And I missed my car insurance, car insurance payment. Um, and by that point I got really fed up with Paige because it was like, you know, this organization has money. I'm literally making huge jumps in our fundraising outside of grant writing. Um, because all that's all Cecilia is doing, like that she's the only person who's done that work. But like the fundraising efforts that we were doing, like people were invested in what we had. Like, so I'm like, I know we have money. And, you know, I was like, okay, can I get a reimbursement? And like to this day, until I took a severance a few days ago or like a, a, last week, I never got fully paid for that, that those $600 that I spent out of my own money for the organization because the white HR and operations manager refused to do her job and instead like pushed it on me as the only black person to do that work for her. And then when I called her out for it and raised that to Paige, Paige basically uh, deflected um, when we had a meeting with the staff and the board also signed off on transitioning Paige to another job because she clearly did not like her job. Um, when I, when we confronted Paige about it, like, Hey, like this is not working. She first was like, Oh, uh, this is an attack. I'm ambushed. And I was like, no, I'm being direct with you because I don't want to keep talking about this with other people. I want to talk about with you. What do you need? Then Paige goes, Oh, well, actually I'm moving to Los Angeles April 1st. And yeah, I just need a transition. And so we were like, okay, yeah, I guess that's fine. You should have said something a really long time ago, but you know, whatever. Um, and then Paige goes to our retreat. And as a person who was supposed to run the entire retreat, she didn't. Um, she then like interrupted it where we were trying to talk about the new impl implementation that um, Cecilia and some other staff members had for kind of the direction of the organization. She was like stopping that process consistently. And so I said like, yeah, like, um, we have an agenda. Can we please follow the agenda? And Paige was like, Cecilia doesn't need any more like advocates. She can do it for herself. Um, I want to talk about the real problems here, which I assume she was going to blame everything on Cecilia. Um, and I was like, no, like the problem is you and your attitude towards me and your attitude towards, um, black and brown workers, because she would always complain about being the only white person in the organization something that the founders and the board have never addressed uh, any of her, any of her very explicitly, in my opinion, racist behavior. Um, and when I kind of like popped off on her in the meeting and I was like, no, like I'm not doing this. You're being racist right now and you need to like stop. She went to the board and met with the staff behind me and Cecilia's back and basically told them that we were aggressive and that we were like detriments to the organization. And lo and behold, after the white woman goes and um, also gets a, a back rub and is like physically comforted by the board in this meeting that me and Cecilia didn't know about because I was out of town for a funeral. Basically plots Cecilia's firing and the eventual, eventual firing of me and the rest of the staff. And that is like their explicit reasoning. Obviously everything Cecilia named adds to it, but their official story and the one that will come up in these um, investigations and whatever court proceedings is going to be over this white person that basically told them to fire us and we got fired.
Yeah, that's a lot. <laughs> so, oh man, I, it's it's so much. So I, I took some notes right now. What, what both of you were talking. Um, so I think with the the lady page, you know, as you know, as as like as communists, as people of color, we joining organizations that try to you know help the community. I see this constantly, and I talk about this, you know, on, on this podcast constantly. That you know, in the past, I have encountered racism by, um, you know, uh, white, you know, leftists, and just white people in general, even anarchists, right? And um, so, I think I want to go back to the structural issue because obviously, Paige was a symptom of the mm -hmm. structure. I mean, obviously, racism within her, you know, themselves, but. Can we talk about the structural issues that happened or that was just happening that caused this? Yeah, I have a lot of thoughts about that. Um, so, okay, I, you know, when I was hired, you know, I was hired into a very unorthodox organization and um, with a lot of accountability and financial problems, but I couldn't necessarily pinpoint as to what those problems were. You know, I looked up workers' dignity on their website. And um, I also talked to people who have who were from Nashville, and I noticed just both an acknowledges like an acknowledgement that it's a messy organization, and at the same time, like also love for the work. And so that made me very curious. And I looked at the organization, and I noticed that um, their board, their worker board, was the um, entity that had all the power, or like that had the the power over the big financial decisions at the organization. And I was very curious. And I, you know, at that point, there was obviously some liberalism still in me um, that I, you know, didn't pinpoint anything. And I didn't say like, okay, this is uh, probably not the most efficient way. But experience has set me straight. So I was being hired in this organization that had a, you know, a legacy, uh, very influential founders. And, in, uh, you know, there is two specific founders, uh, but then they're also part of this cadre of, I would say, maybe rat lips and um, also anarchists as well. Um, you know, just a group of uh, primarily white folks uh, that founded the organization were among the first, like, volunteers, uh, the people who really got it started. And they represent the dominant ideology in Nashville. You know, uh, 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 you know, in, in, in Nashville, uh, the left, as I, I, I imagine that this is also happening in the country, but I can only talk about, you know, what's happening here. Um, you know, just a disdain and a skepticism towards any kind of hierarchy, labeling it as authoritarian or um, uh, just a lot of misconceptions about what um, authoritarian authority means, like under a Marxist lens, right? And at the same time that they, you know, worship horizontality and structurelessness. They also romanticize what it means to be uh, a, a worker leader. So what I also noticed is that, you know, they were putting these workers in positions of authority and power, but the amount of development that it takes is is, is great. If we want to put workers as leaders, like I am a firm believer in that. I'm a firm believer in developing strategists. And I also have to be realistic about the fact that often those that are most directly affected by an issue are often also the most systematically and uh, intentionally uh, underdeveloped, right, as well. That we're going to have to give folks the tools because workers are just people. And people will have a variety of ideas and perspectives and politics. And so it is our job uh, to actually put the time and effort um, into, into developing their leadership and to put them in a position to be authentic through leaders, right? That are not susceptible to manipulation or just the dominant ideology. And anyways, so I came in into this organization and, you know, I was uh, at that moment, we were co-directors. They were co-directors at Workers' Dignity. 
So Workers' Dignity, um, the umbrella was primarily Latinx, and then they had a campaign that was called Music City Writers United, a bus writers union that was primarily Black. Also, uh, the base was primarily Black. They never really had uh, Black leadership. And so it was often uh, the founder who was the interim uh, co-director um, when the campaign was alive. Um, or um, a white girl that was an interim uh, a co-director when I, you know, was hired on board. Um, the campaign doesn't exist anymore. I wonder why. So, yeah. Um, and there's no base. Like, there's, yeah, there was there, no yeah. base. Uh, yeah. So there was a lot of accountability issues. And I was, like, asked to be a director, the most visible and, uh, you know, they having also the liability of ensuring that the organization stayed afloat without the tools to be able to do that. And nobody on staff even had the tools uh, or able to do that. On top of that, I was hired um, at a moment where the staff uh, were also all hired directly from uh, the, the low wage worker base. And not develop enough. I mean, there was not an encouragement of discipline. Um, and it is my understanding that I was hired because of my capacity, but also because of my race, because they wanted to get uh, leaders that were from, you know, ideally, uh, like a Latinx co-director and a Black co-director. And uh, in part, it was because it is my understanding and my assessment that the white founders, which was like the interim director at the moment, they just couldn't confront people of color and like hold them accountable with the fear of, you know, being called a racist, which is incredibly dehumanizing. So like you get some people of color to clean up the mess, great, great, great. Um, and not being given the tools to do that. And so what happens when you have a group of people or workers that have all the power to hire and fire, but they're not there present uh, in the everyday of, you know, when the work is getting done? Obviously, what happens is that we have to run basically a school board campaign because it's that it's a board that we have to convince and persuade to, to make any direction that we think it needs to be made. And so the board is fully susceptible to manipulation. I mean, it is, it is an ad, it is, it is, you have to advocate to the board to get anything done. And so it becomes an, an advocacy campaign. And, um, uh, you know, some people get caught up on that and some people don't catch up on that. Um, and whenever people say, well, you know, uh, this person is manipulating the board, I will say everybody is manipulating the board because the structure itself um, is, is prone to mani is necessitates uh, manipulation. Yeah, so I have a quick question. So you said earlier that there was like a, a lack of hierarchy, but there's this board that has power. How do these people get on the board? Who chose them to get on the board? You know, just a quick question. Thank you. So they're supposed to be democratically elected through a membership assembly. And so uh, the board president has been on the board since I got hired and then the other person wa got to the board in 2020. And so some of the processes to uh, pick people on the board were uh, more democratic than others, but in general, it is the membership that elects them and, uh, um, and, and they're supposed to rotate. But that's also one of the issues that we had with the board that currently uh, we had elections in September of 2022 and two women were elected to the board and uh, the board president approved the candidates and everything. Um, it was a youth, um, uh, a young woman and an older woman that were elected to the board and um, the board refused to onboard them. But that's like, you know, another story. Uh, in general, yeah, there is a contradiction. You have a, all the power uh, and you created a hierarchy whether you want it or not. And so, I was the first co-director elected also through a democratic process by, you know, the board at a time and also um, went through a series of interviews and working interviews 
uh, with different members of the community, a worker's dignity. Um, but before, it was a fully horizontal workplace where all staff were at the same level. And then uh, the structure before I got there, thankfully, I didn't work in that structure because it sounds awful. Uh, each different board member was in charge of supervising uh, different staff members. And so basically, the board was just a big unpaid staff uh uh, and and obviously that didn't work. It created a lot of conflict, and it you know led the organization to nearly collapsing. Um, and that's why the membership asked for some kind of hierarchy, for some accountability, and um, you know just some direction. Um, and this was a compromise. Say like, okay, well let's have co-directors, but let's give these co-directors absolutely no power in terms of executive decisions. Okay, so my next question goes with several points that you, both of y'all talked about was that, that not green with politics, but you know, that's kind of like um, shadowed or like, you know, that the main situation was that this organization that says, my understanding, you know, works with, with workers, um, has rallied in politics and anarchists in it, you know, and and because because you voiced your you know you being you being Marxist, like they started to discriminate discriminate against you, and to me it's kind of weird because Marxists are pro workers, <laughs> you know. So like, can you talk about that? Like you're here as a Marxist advocating for workers. But once you voice out your politics as pro worker, they discriminate. It's, it's fucking odd to me. I mean, they were organizing against me since I got there, right? Like one of the uh, main members of the anarchist gallery, I, I call him like Nashville's anarchist daddy. I, you know, who was having the interview uh, at Workers' Dignity at the moment. Uh, he found out that I was in Nashville. We had a beer. I asked him, hey, what do you know about Workers' Dignity? He was like, I don't think he should have co directors at all. And I just don't believe in that. And uh, throughout my time at Workers' Dignity, there's been efforts to uh, get rid of that co-director structure, uh, which you know I can name, but it's it's they have been trying and just distrustful of the fact that I have too much power. They're always concerned with the fact like I'm gonna have too much power. I'm hoarding too much power. And honestly, like I have all the clout and none of the like real authority power. Like I I. Uh, it has been, it has created so much frustration toward my time. I have, you know, been hospitalized out of like a stress related issues, um, just out of the fact that, you know, it has been Im impossible to actually hold certain stuff accountable, especially, um, you know, when they do serious, like serious things, like sometimes you do not, um, uh, you're not going to create friends when you uh, fire people, but there's some folks that like, if we are doing this work, you got to take it seriously. And, um, you know, it has frustrated me so much. Um, but more recently, I started to realize my politics. I think one of the reasons why I um, was taken with more empathy and grace uh before i was more explicitly i was an anarcho communist before or like i would say like i am an anarcho communist cuz i you know see uh uh i don't know what i uh, was thinking but i you know started to experience kind of set me straight and i just started to um align more with um the marxist leninist line i want uh, to be intentional. I think that it's important to be explicit about structure. I think that, uh, you know, a shared analysis of the root causes of oppression and the conditions of oppression and the priorities are, is really important. I think we need to want to win anything in Tennessee or anywhere. Um, and so I started to align more with um, the, 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 the Leninist line and I you know, there were some folks in the organization uh, or like in the surroundings, in the community of the organization that had influence over um, the the board and, you know, were close to the founders and the founding cadre. 
of, of organizers, um, you know, they started to realize and at the beginning they started to challenge me in, you know, DMs or, or phone calls or, you know, um, uh, you know, trying to push back against, you know, what I was trying to say. And, you know, I was trying to say that I wanted to develop leaders that were competent and strategic. And uh, for some reason that got interpreted into I am an authoritarian uh, dictator that, um, you know, is there to hoard all the power for herself. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Oh, Sorry, continue. Go ahead. No, 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 go ahead. I mean, I think uh, this is where it kind of just like leads to the, hopefully for the listeners and like your audience, like the bigger picture here of how any actual like critique and engagement with the ideas of people who are not on the compatible left, um, who are not afraid to be called like, you know, I mean, one word I've heard throughout all of this is like tanky and like coming from like a 30 year old like man who, you know, you know, hopefully has like a life outside the internet, but I really can't hold out too much for that anymore now. But like, you know, these, these like McCarthy is uh, just straight up like Cold War sentiments that have kind of really propelled um, us into a space where if you don't agree with the State Department's line on anything, especially anything regarding socialist um, governments, whether past or present, you are marked for life as somebody who is you know, authoritarian, and this term is used like over and over again, especially in this context. Um, and people don't really engage with like what the word authoritarian means, which is that like, you are willing to use the power that you have to assert your um, ideas, which sounds so vague and scary, but like, that's like literally what every government does ever. And like, I've had people tell me stuff that like native people asking for land back is authoritarian. Like anarchists will say that and they do because it's like, you're telling me what to do and I don't like it. So that means it's bad. And it ultimately hails the individual and individual interests and individual feelings over everything. And they think that because it's just them in their mind, um, that that's somehow like not authoritarian. But time and time again in this situation, the people who have like coalesced um, against people who, because I'm not gonna lie, I was already I was already on that when I met Cecilia, and like it's the same shit basically. Yeah, I have a question for you, T. I think you said earlier, you know, when you first started talking, uh, that their experience was failing. So I think I don't know about I don't, don't want to assume, but it kind of seems like this was their experience failing, but I don't know if also their lack of understanding workers' politics or Marxism, you know? So I don't know if you want to get into that. What, what did you mean by their experience was failing? Yeah. Um, yeah. So these like founders that Cecilia is talking about, like I didn't actually meet them until they were telling us that Cecilia was fired. Like they had never met me reached out to me, talked to me as a staff member. They didn't acknowledge me when they came into the office that I like was spending like way over 40 hours at every day. Um, but they felt the need to tell me that like, I have no deserve, like I don't deserve a say one in my own like experience, but two in Cecilia's firing. And they, they kept using this excuse of like, and every, and, and even probably after this, right? Their excuse for ignoring um, anyone else who's like in support of Cecilia is going to be, well, you weren't here. Like I've been here longer and touching on like the music city, uh, writers, um, like bus campaign that Cecilia is talking about is like, you got a concession, but you didn't build a movement. Right. And so everything that they have is like dead. Like they can 
wave it up as like a victory or like take a concession, take a crumb, take a testimony or an individual story and like hail it as a victory for all workers. But they like fundamentally lack like any analysis on how uh, how that concession could be used towards something bigger because they have nothing bigger in mind. Like they own houses. They're not they're not tenants. Most of these people involved in this are homeowners. Most of the people involved in the situation make way more than all of the staff members combined, right? So they're like the labor aristocracy saying that the concessions that they won were proof that they are more more uh, capable than we are and have a say, but all they're capable of doing is misleading the working class into being satiated. So, okay, I have a quick question. These people you're talking about are board members, right? It's the board members and it's the founders. Oh, okay, the founders. Um, I have a quick question uh, attached to this. Um, and the founders and the board members, are they all white or are they mixed of different ethnicities? You take that, Cecilia. So the board members themselves are um, just uh, Latinos. Two Latin, th three Latinos, right? Um, and founders are both of them are white, well, Puerto Rican. Although, um, you know, she is white passing. I am unsure about uh, her um, ethnicity. In set, like, you know, I am. I'm, I'm unsure. She uh, looks white. Um, and the prime, the founding cadre I'm talking about, uh, the people that really. Um, I guess build workers' dignity uh, are primarily white. Okay, so I do have a question, and it's to T. You know, I do. It's really sad. I think that you know people, like I said earlier, you, you're an organ in, in an organization that is to, is meant to help workers, right? And you discriminate against people that are you know Marxist which is a workers, you know, pro-worker or uh, ideology, but something that happened to you is very concerning. You know, this whole, you were applying to law school and one of the, you know, people that worked there, they did a sabotage, almost like a sabotage slander stalking situation. You want to talk about that? Oh yeah. Um, well, yeah. And that's, it's two things too. So basically the night that they made all the staff come, um, two hours earlier than our set meeting time. So I actually had to leave home um, at their beck and call. They had brought this person to the meeting after I had said that I wasn't comfortable with that person in the space because of some things that I was like finding out about them. And the fact that they had like a financial relationship to workers dignity um, at some point, his social security number was attached to our bank account while he was like, basically like shitting on the organization um to other spaces to kind of hinder the work that we were doing and that made no sense to me because if you have a financial relationship to an organization why would you do that um unless your intention is to sabotage so that already had me feeling away um i was finding out things that he wasn't being truthful about to me and i kind of looked to him as like a mentor somebody like or someone who could be my mentor who could kind of do the kind of stuff in law school that I wanted to do and still want to do um, because Vanderbilt doesn't really have like a labor law robust like program. So to find that out was really concerning and I wanted to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with him before like we move forward with him being a part of the organization still. And like the board agreed to that. They said that they would not have him around until we had a talk, but lo and behold, um, they lied. And that Monday when they fired Cecilia, he came, um, I had shut the door before he came in and basically, I guess they had already given him the code or it was always the same code, but he opened the door and shoved me through the door and the board pushed me out the door. Um, and when I asked my boyfriend, who is his, his classmate, you know, Hey, can you talk to him? Like, I don't know why he's doing this right now because he knows me. Um, 
He told my boyfriend to never speak to him again, went to the dean of the law school while my application was still pending, told the dean of the law school about me as an active applicant at the school, told the, told the dean that my boyfriend was um, aggressive and that he scared him as a black man, which is really concerning to tell a white dean, um, and also lied and told the dean that I assaulted him because he pushed me through the door, um, which the door didn't even swing the other way. So he had to have pushed the door into me to even get in, which by the laws of physics, he I could not have assaulted him. Um, so lying about a black person who's applying to a law school and telling the dean that that black person assaulted you in support of strike breaking efforts and is the president of the Labor and Employment Law Society at Vanderbilt Law and on the board of the Public Interest Law Program. So he's, he's supposed to be the premier, go to a uh, social justice labor law student. And not only is he strike breaking, he's um, using like an institution. And it, thankfully they didn't believe him because he lies all the time. Apparently that was nothing new to them that he lies. Um, but he had tried to get me and my boyfriend in trouble further for trying to talk to him about why he was doing this. And um, and I just can't help but under, like ask why you would need to use an institution that you know is going to default to white supremacy in most cases to handle this for you if you're a quote unquote uh, worker advocate and a labor lawyer. And I, I find that to be really telling of like their true politics. I think that's that's you know, I've seen that and I've experienced that, and I you know I I feel for you, and I feel like this is you know for somebody that wants that claims to be an advocate for workers, you know like fucking with somebody's livelihood with their education, with their connections, with their future, it's just a really shitty thing to do, um, and yeah. it's you know when I, when you told me that I was like God damn this is it's like a plague you know, within the grassroots uh, community. And it's a, a lot of like rattled behavior, a lot of like uh, sabotage behavior, like, oh, I don't like this person now, so I'm gonna sabotage their life, spread rumors, <laughs> and, you make know. Sure and, pay their bills or see deposits. Yeah, yeah make, making sure all this and that. And it's pretty shitty, man. Like these people are supposed to be like, quote unquote, revolutionary, quote unquote, you know, uh, for the people. But they act differently. It's like this hatred these Americans have, you know, this is like, uh, and, you know, it, people think it's, it's just Anglo-Americans or white people, but sometimes it's Latinos. They, they emulate, you know, these behaviors. And I think sometimes, and they, and they do it sometimes more aggressively. And I think, yeah, yeah and it's a uh, pretty shitty, um, I mean, it's, it's so hard because like I've, I've said this, like, talked about my experience my experiences within grassroots and sometimes you know i'm just like man what the fuck's happening this is why there's no movement in this country you know because there's so much petty behavior just talk it out you know just talk it out or whatever the hell but it's like oh they're communists they must be you know you know fucked up they want to be a dictator like you know they claim cecilia wants to be a dictator or power hungry or just all these weird things that, you know, that come from like the Red Scare movement, you know, all these crazy things you hear about communists, you know, so they, they put it on us. And it's just, it's really sad, you know, and um, nothing gets, nothing this changes. Everything's just. Yeah, I mean, calling Cecilia a tanky and then calling me like a Fed. Mm -hmm. Like they were calling me a federal agent. Red jacketing, yeah. Yeah. That's that's another that's one, yeah. So dangerous. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we yeah. That it, it happened to a, a, a friend of the podcast here uh like a couple months ago. And then it happened to me by white people, by white. Yep. Yeah. You know, recently I, mean, I don't know if you guys saw that post I made on Instagram. So some white quote unquote leftist trying to fit jacket me. And I was just like, what are you talking about? Like, you know, this is the stupidest shit I've ever heard. Um but okay, so with everything that that has happened, do you do y'all have support 
of the workers, local workers, or do they have a support? So they all, nearly all of the active membership has taken a very firm stand uh, in our support. So they're on our, on our, on our site. Um, first, um, in, within the first week of uh, my firing and the strike happening, 80 members, 80 active members uh, issued a letter to the board asking for uh, evidence and um, an explanation uh, around my firing and the claims that folks were making against me. Uh, they asked about car clarification around the racial discrimination uh, that T was experiencing and the black workers from a campaign were experiencing. Um, mm -hmm. And then also um, the sexual harassment from the board president towards me and others. Uh, and they asked for a for for the board to actually meet with the members. Right. It was like, hey, meet with us. Let's have a conversation and uh, we need to be taken into account. The board completely ignored that. Uh, the members kept mobilizing and making assemblies, inviting the board members, and the board kept ignoring that. Uh, at some point, the board um, disconnected the um, water and electricity from the office where members were still meeting without staff. They were still holding meetings uh, for committees and campaigns, and um, the, um, the board just disconnected the, the water and light without them ever talking to the members. They went on TV, they emailed all of our uh, supporter base, uh, they issued public letters, everything but talking to the members, right? And so the members felt be very unhurt. Um, I, I still, we have maintained the support of the uh, vast majority of the active membership. And so, yeah, I mean, like, the members are with us. Uh, the um, Many people in the activist community uh, were in support of the board because what they were saying, like, well, this is the active, this is the worker board, like, we need to listen to the workers. And it's like, which workers? Like, the uh, three workers that agree with you or the uh, over 100 workers that do not, right? And um, I just, just pointing out that contradiction right there. T? Um, well, Oh, just on the last thing you said, but I'm gonna go back to what I was gonna say. Like the two of the board members, like they they hire, like they have their own companies now. So they would use workers' dignity as a place to recruit more workers actually for their businesses, um, which like I said, they're making way more than the staff at this point. Um, and infantilizing them because they are like Latino and they speak Spanish primarily is like really like rad live white people behavior. Um, and second, like when it talks about the uh, utilities being cut off, the board did talk to somebody, but they talked to the white person who the utilities were actually in the name of because workers dignity had never actually gotten the utilities transferred over from the white person who's associated with the founders. Um, it was always in his name. And like, we have the piece of paper showing that it was in his name. And this is the same white person that showed up in our negotiations as like a translator. And like, he didn't say anything to any of the staff about like cutting off utilities. He just did it. And like the fact that he had all this power as this anarchist, I, like shutting off utilities on people like anarchistly, I don't know how that fits in your politic, but I mean, anything for the individual, right? Yeah, and also, uh, you know, these anarchists that we're talking about, I know that it's maybe very confusing for people, right? So, like, we have the worker board, and then uh, we have these, around them, there is a circle of activists that have a lot of influence in the local scene here in Nashville, primarily anarchists, but then also, you know, some liberals sprinkle in the mix, if you can tell them apart. Um, but yeah, I mean, the person uh, that was uh, talking, uh, talking shared about the in front of the dean of the law school also was one of the main reasons that I got fired, right? And this, you know, this pattern of lies um, and not wanting to be accountable over these lies is also what got us here. Um, the person doesn't just lie about the fact that the, uh, you know, the saying that the assaulted him 
you know, he was lying about his background while having a lot of organizational power, access to our finances, like access to an organization's credit card, access to our board, which is the boss of the organization. And, you know, he was lying about his background and his wealth, saying that, you know, his dad was an exploited Uber driver being exploited for, you know, over a hundred hours a week driving Uber. And um, I caught up on the fact that his dad was in tech and, um, you know, had at some point led the operations uh, countrywide of uh, Guatemala's PepsiCo. Like, so we know what Pepsi and Coca-Cola do in our countries, right? Like nothing good. And so I confronted him for that. And um, you were called. Yeah, then I got fired. In him, that's what they say. You know, I think I think Marxists or you know in, in communists know that Ralibs co-opt liberals co-opt our movements, our phrases, and then whenever we come into the area or spaces, they kind of like shoo us away. They paint us as aggressive, but this also goes with also being a person of color. If you're black, if you're indigenous, you know you're too aggressive if you speak up you know, and we have to like act like them and look like them, you know, and it's like this like always constant, you know, we have to like reform ourselves to their image, you know, and I think it's pretty shitty. Um, but okay, so people that are listening that first heard of this, how can people support you? How can people follow you, your work? How can people, you know, give you support? Miss Tinky. Well, you can follow the uh, you can follow our Instagram Workers Dignity Union. Uh, you can sign our petition, uh, which um, I'm going to share the link with Rick. Um, and also, you can um, leave a bad review for Workers Dignity in Google for sure, like just for you know just to pass the time. Um, and you can email, uh, you know, the the um, cadre of activists that are supporting the boards running the operations at Workers Dignity. You can contact them at info at workersdignity.org. Ask them to uh, give severances to all the terminated staff members because until right now, uh, T has received a severance. Um, but there are still many staff members, including myself, who don't have access to a severance. And um, not only that, but the uh, terminated striking workers that you know went on strike for over a month while on unpaid suspension, uh, they were asked to sign uh, illegal NDAs, giving up their rights to fight the labor violations that they were experiencing or speak about the labor violations that they were experiencing. Um, so in order to access the severance, so which is coercion and it is illegal. And, um, you know, we want to go our separate ways, but also it is important to make sure that workers are getting uh, the severances, um, you know, for all the work they've done for the organization. Yeah, I mean, I think all of those are like primary. Um, I want to add that like everyone who was terminated, um, besides I guess that little letter from Cecilia, like whatever they passed around to fire Cecilia, like no one, um, no one was given a reason for their termination, like at all. They were exercising their um, you know, at will rights as an employer. So um, I think that people should really, really think about like what a, what you should be reasonably expecting a workers' rights center to be, what it should look like. And really like, you know, ask your own questions about people like Cecilia, um, in places like workers dignity where you know it's just a lot of people who don't really have a corroboration of their claims and more so draw from personal experience to justify using means like strike breaking like um 
proving the case for at will legislation, which is like very uh very racially uh charged legislation, by the way. Um and yeah, like supporting the staff because like they weren't they weren't like none of us were even given a reason for our firing and like ultimately, you know, the the person who goes to law school for this, like he told someone that he got a full ride to go to the same law school. And even though I did eventually get in, like I didn't get it, like nearly enough money to go. Um, and so I had to take a severance because I have to go to another place to pursue a legal education because like I'm clearly not welcome in Nashville. So um, just like helping and understanding like that this is a call to step up and not to cower and hide and supporting people like Cecilia and everybody else on staff is one way that that can happen. Yeah. And I think none of these would have happened. Like, I just want to make sure that everybody knows, like, none of these would have happened if we were not operating in isolation. Like, we were an exceptional group in the area. We were literally just doing the basics. Like, we just knew how to base build, and we knew how to win campaigns. We knew how to do uh, leadership development and keep members and retain members. Um, but most of the groups, like, I wouldn't just say Nashville, but most of the groups in the country, like, they don't even get that right, right? Um, and none of this would have happened if we didn't, if we actually were part of an ecosystem of organizations that were aligned uh, in terms of our analysis, in terms of our priorities, um, and were there to support us. Because a lot of the things that, um, you know, people, uh, the, some of the allegations against me, like, the people that are pushing against my firing have done things much worse, but people protect them because they are part of the dominant ideology, right? So none of this would have happened if we had, uh, you know, more open uh, Marxists that were acting in coordination with each other. Yeah, that, that was going to be my next question is like, you know, I think you answered it. If you, if you didn't like vocally say you're a Marxist, do you think you would have gotten <laughs> fired or discriminated upon, um, you know? I think it was going to happen regardless because of the work that we were doing. I mean, we were uh, the target of some jealousy, and I am going to state it that way, right? I mean, for example, we had a lot of the housing organizations that had made their whole identity to do housing work and, uh, you know, to do tenant unions, and, you know, they managed to do some uh, service providing and, and, and but didn't necessarily accomplish things. And we came out of these have never, we've never done housing. Um, we had uh, two paid organizers on the ground, including myself, which, you know, I was a director, I had other things to do. And we had volunteers, but like, literally, we just had two paid staff members on the ground for our two tenant union campaigns had never done housing before. And then we uh, in a single year, we solidify our name as like one of the leading, if not the leading housing organization in, in town. Um, so there was a lot of, um, th there was some hostility by the other housing organizations, which I tried to uh, work on. I tried to build some trust, but um, I think we were prone to uh, the attacks just by the fact that um, we represented a rising tendency, but also a um, the right way to do the work, actually engaging in the work. And we were a proof that it was possible to do this in Nashville, that we didn't have to continue to blame the opposition about uh, our, our failings. And uh, yeah, their opposition is strong and they are, uh, uh, there's no, not quite the same amount of funding going to the Southeast of the United States as there is uh, going to New York or California, but our strategies, our tactics, our, our methods, our way of doing the work is something in our control and something that we can do better. Um, and it's something that many organizations might not want to just recognize, right? They don't wanna see it. Yeah, um, and to answer that question a little bit more, like, I think it would have happened regardless because um, obviously Marxist-Leninist um, thought is an analysis, um, but even, and I think that you know this, 
Rick as somebody. We're gonna have to cut that, aren't we? Yes. I didn't say your name. Sorry. Ah. Um, but basically, like no, I go, I go, I go by Rick on the podcast. Oh my god. Okay. Thank God. <laughs> um, I was like, damn. But basically, like you as somebody who kind of understands this, um, from your perspective as somebody you know who is indigenous, like you're gonna be a target and you're gonna be a uh, pariah because ultimately you are not gonna be if you're not willing to sit down and be a good pet for them be um and cecilia wasn't willing to be this i wasn't willing to be this um you know i'm not i wasn't willing just to be there and say that me being in that position was a win for my community that wasn't enough for me and i was very explicit from the beginning that like no actually you need you know we need to do more to organize black and brown workers together in solidarity and i think just also that idea alone was you know, with or without the explicit Marxist analysis, which I'm not going to claim for uh, McCarthy reasons, um, like that was inevitably a threat enough. Um, everything that you're doing that directs back towards the base of the masses and actually uh, galvanizing them towards action is authoritarian. It's tankyism. It's uh, I mean, it's slave revolt. It is the end of the modern Inca Mienda system. It is all of that. And they want subjugated neo-colonial shills. And because, because most of the white people involved in this, especially the founders, and I'll say this organization's name, they work for this organization or are affiliated with called Surge, which is supposed to be a racial justice organization. And they have all explicitly ignored and even to some extent said that my discrimination um, claims are a distraction um, and dismiss me time and time again. Uh, I explicitly asked the board to give me a transition meeting to, to let them, um, to hold them to account to still do the work, right? And they didn't wanna, they didn't care about what I had to do with black workers or what I wanted to continue, even if I wasn't getting paid or if I wasn't there, they didn't care. Um, because you're not actually supposed to be organizing black people, you're supposed to be misleading them. You're not supposed to be organizing indigenous people, you're supposed to be misleading them. You're supposed to be their like little like neo-colonial shill who satiates them again into ultimately never doing anything to take power for themselves. And that's that's the story here. Like that's the story is that like we, and Marx was observing this phenomenon so like when we say Marxist, like all he was doing was putting a pen to like sovereignty, self-determination and self-organization through collective action, through, um, you know, formations that existed before capitalism and also hold a framework for times after the fall of capitalism. Um, these are the people who inspired Marx and those people are us, people like us, because we we know a world without this can exist. And we see it and working with the, the people we work with is our window into that new world. So people like this, like they might be blinders, they might shudder it, but they're never going to fucking stop it. And like, I know they're going to listen to this podcast and I want them to know, like, I'm coming for y'all bitches. And so is every other black person who cares about our community. And so is every other person that Cecilia organizes with. And one day, inshallah, you will pay for your fucking crimes to the people. And like, they will turn against you because the earth has a memory. The earth has a memory, the people have a memory. And yeah. Yeah, I think this conversation is really deep, you know, and uh, so I think it's ironic, because, like I said before, you know, like having somebody on the board that's a business owner and that organization is supposed to be for workers. And I think that's a conflict of interest right there itself, right? And I think what for Marxists or communists, you know, uh, one of the big aspects is is walk to walk practice, you know, practice is a big one, not just theories, also practice, you know. So, and what you are doing is practice, getting workers together you know, training, uh, organizing campaigns, which is like the work, you know, the meat. And for 
it's just you know like at the end of the day it, I, I said it over and over again it just fucks with my mind that people that are claiming to be pro-worker would discriminate against marxists that are like the core of workers politics right and then and then just you know do a standard campaign which is you know plagues like i said before it plagues the um the grassroots movement because i've experienced it i have other people that have experienced it you know within grassroots it's the slander following sabotaging your connections oh let me whisper hey man this person's fucked up hey don't, don't you know rick's fucked up and it's just like oh my god or i i, I see you know people send me screenshots of like comments about me or you know about other people like don't talk to this person don't talk to that person i'm like i'm not going to stop talking to somebody because you tell me to right like let me decide for myself let me let me see let me see the details but then you know people it's a weird phenomenon i don't know if it's the, the colonial culture in this country but it's like people eating other people you know like wanting to be on top wanting to be leader but then same thing they're not leader and it's just a big mess and i think y'all's examples your experience everything i've seen online you know I, I was just shocked because like i said i said earlier in the beginning of this of this recording was i've been following y'all for a while and i respect cecilia and in, in her, in her work you know and i saw she made some marxist tweets and then it just went downhill real quick and i was just like what the fuck, what the fuck happened you know and and it's it's really sad, and I think you know, and and this is like requires a whole different conversation that maybe we can record on. You know, anarchists always say that we discriminate against discriminate against them, but I'm like at the same time I'm like, look what you're doing too, man. Like you can't have this like really shitty attitude, you know. Um, I saw like I think it was a book fair somewhere. It was like last year for for, for some anarchists like trashed and Marxist. Uh, a booth with books and stuff like that at a book fair and I was like why would you do that well you know we, if we're really on the same path together which we're not ideology our ideology is not the same but it's close right but you shouldn't discriminate but you know that's a that's a different totally different conversation but you know um I don't want to keep you too long I know we want to keep this episode about your experience and maybe another episode about like the whole theory part of it, you know. Um, but what is what are your goals after after this fiasco? Like, what are your yeah? You know? Yeah, and I also just want to point out that like it's also that marriage that they have to these structures that are not working. And part of being Marxist is also being able to look at things scientifically and uh, look at the evidence. Is this practice? Is this strategy working for us or not? And if it's not working for us, like it doesn't have to be a reflection on your capacity. It doesn't have to be like mistakes are happening. I, I, I mess up. I fuck up all the time and I'm going to continue to fuck up. But it's important that I acknowledge that and that I am self-critical. And just, just that lack of capacity for self-criticism that really gets me in which like, hey, oh, do we want to be part of an organization that has a crisis every single year? And yeah, I agree with the fact that like, they say that they're being attacked, but I have never gone for anybody's jobs. Last time I can remember, I uh, didn't launch uh, uh, these kinds of um, gossip and character assassination campaigns. Um, and so just I just want to point out that, that contradiction. I mean, right now, what we know is that working class people are really feeling it. Uh, because we continue to have the trust and the support of the majority of the active member base. And so what comes after that, I don't know. Uh, I think that is something that we have to um, define uh, collectively, right, as a group, and thinking about how do we want to proceed after, um, do we want to um, start a new group, uh, do we want to, um, you know, what what will the direction be? So it's something that we're gonna have to define for ourselves. Um, but what we know is that you know Nashville's feeling it, and you know they can fire us, but they cannot get rid of the work and the seeds that were already planted, and um, the awareness that 
uh, many workers now have about their conditions and how to change them. Yeah, so I think my, one of my last questions would be, I think you said where people can find you, right? Um, do you have anybody have closing statements before finish or are we, are we good? Um, I think I just, I know I said it earlier when I was like talking about how I got involved with workers unity, but I just have to like really pose this like question again for people to like really think about is like, are your like personal or petty ideo ideological disagreements with people more important than continuing the work? Um, and do the people that that are being served by these like tankies or whatever, do they deserve your utter like lack of um, care and you know solidarity because they are willing to side with the people who have been with them um, most consistently and most uh, mo most in like mostly like in an empowering way and not in a charity way, because I think that's what they're going to turn this organization back into is a direct service charity. Um, and, you know, I just think that, uh, that people should really think about like the material impact of this and like the graveness of it, because like this was the only worker center in the entire state. And they decided that it was worth collapsing over this and what does that say about their regard for the workers that they claim to serve? Okay. Well, thank you for <laughs> thank you for um, your words. Don't hang up or don't log off. We're gonna, you know, chat a little bit before after I stop recording. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having us.